go ahead and, and turn to Galatians chapter 2. We'll begin there in just a moment. Um, but I, I've noticed um, there's been a common thread, at least through a lot of our messages lately, having to do with pride um, and kind of what exactly pride is, because I think it's easy for us to recognize pride in other people, <laughs> but maybe not in ourselves. Um, but we all, we all know what it is. We can recognize it when we see it. Um, but I was kind of looking at the definitions of pride and boldness and meekness, kind of what we're called to be and what we're called not to be. Um, and pride is essentially thinking highly of yourself, um, of your opinion, of your understanding. Um, and I, I think one of the definitions of pride was to have inordinate self-esteem. <laughs> so basically misplaced um, an excessively high opinion of oneself um, abhorrence of what you consider unworthy. So you basically hate what you think is beneath you or your opinion um, or your understanding. Um, and then something that's often considered related, a related term, is boldness. Um, but they're really so different. People think of them in the same vein. And even when you look up the definition, they'll, they'll be that's a related term. Um, but it's much simpler um, essentially means that you're assured or confident. It doesn't have anything to do with your own view of your self-worth or your understanding. It's completely separate. Um, so I wanted to look at some of that today and read from some of the examples that we have of how we're supposed to be in, in relation to pride and boldness and meekness. Um, so like I said, we'll, we'll begin in Galatians chapter 2. And this is one of the examples... Um, that I thought of immediately um, when I was kind of rattling some of this around in my head for the last few weeks, which is the Apostle Paul's example, um, which when you put it into context of everything he went through, um, it's, it's pretty incredible the, the meekness and humility he had in this particular circumstance. So we'll begin in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they, uh, and they to the circumcised." Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Now, I'm not very good at math, but in the, the previous chapter, um, it says that, uh, or in this chapter, it says that he went back up to, Jer to Jerusalem after 14 years. And in the previous chapter, it says he went to meet Peter after three years. So we have at least 17 years between Paul's conversion and when he goes to share this, what he's preaching with them. Paul, 17 years of Paul going through some of the things he went through and the shipwrecks and beatings for the faith. He, he, Jesus himself taught him. But even, even through all that, he still presented that to the pillars of the faith to see if he was, had run in vain or was running in vain. And that is just incredible to me. He had the assurance, but he still was going to present that before the other apostles and the brethren. Um, he didn't have pride knowing, like, I was taught by Jesus. I don't have to prove anything to you. He presented that to them in meekness and humility. Um, yeah, he submitted himself, again, in order to make sure that he was not running or had not run in vain. Um, turn to Numbers chapter 12. We'll read a little bit about Moses and his 
example of extreme humility over and over. This is just one of very many, but Numbers chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman who he had married. For he had married a Cushite woman, and they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out, and the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against the servant of Moses, or my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous uh, like snow, and Aaron turned towards Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, O my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O God, please heal her, please. So Moses was, was bold. We, we have many, many examples of his boldness, even though in the beginning he was saying, I don't speak well. Like he didn't have pride in his own, even after all he had been through at that point. Like Moses wasn't a kid when the Lord said, I'm going to have you go do this. Like he was seasoned, but he still was like, I'm not good at talking. You should have somebody else. So he wasn't prideful in his own thinking and understanding and ability or capability. Um, but Moses was bold. And like I said, we have we could read most of the Old Testament and see that. Um, But his response to the Lord's judgment, and not just here, but many times, was to pray and ask God to relent. Even though the reason that Miriam and Aaron were being punished was halfway on his behalf. Kind of the Lord was saying, you didn't didn't treat him right. Uh, But he still stepped in and and prayed to the Lord to stop that. and there's such a, a, what I thought about last night is there's such a stark lack of presumption with him and, and these other brethren, like with Paul, what we just read, when they very well could have, you know, they could presume that they have full standing, they don't need anyone else. They didn't do that. Um, they could have operated that way on the basis of their own standing and understanding, um, and they wouldn't have been wrong. Um, on the basis of the facts, you know what I mean? But that's still not what they were called to do. Um, they were humble men, and they, they acted that out. Um, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Begin in verse 1 of Philippians chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who through who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we even see Jesus' example, which Paul and Moses and the other saints, they were just mirroring that. 
that was the spirit in them mirroring that very thing where he had Jesus had equal footing with the Father and chose to step down, but the Father exalted him as a result. You know, we're not going to read it, but I was thinking, you know, about Gideon, which I think about a lot just because I think there's a lot of parallels with all of us when, you know, the Lord, <laughs> the Lord chose him and he was like, like me, like it was, it was kind of, he didn't understand why it didn't make sense by looking at it. Um, but he was clearly not a prideful man. Um, but he was bold when it came time to fulfill what God had set him aside for, which to me, like, that's one of the clearest examples. You can see what Gideon said and did when the Lord said, go do this. It wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with him. He knew he wasn't anything special in and of himself. He said it when God first spoke to him. He said, yeah, but I'm, I'm of the weakest tribe. I'm the weakest of all of them. Like I, I'm the worst you could have possibly picked. So it wasn't that he thought his understanding or capability or he was a warrior and all that it had nothing to do with it. He had boldness because he had the assurance of what God had told him. It wasn't in his pride in his own capability or anything else that he knew or could do um, or his own skill or anything. He knew it was all going to be the Lord. And that's the thread with all these is whatever abilities that we have, it, it doesn't, it's inconsequential. It doesn't matter because if something's going to happen, it's going to be the Lord doing it. He has to do it. Um, so pretty much the worse off we are, probably the better for him so that we're not relying on our own anything. Um, but I think that pride manifests itself most, you know, in our overconfidence and our own ability and capabilities in doing things. Um, but I thank God for the examples he set out of these saints who, especially in in the flesh, and not even in the flesh, but like we talked about Paul, who at that by that time, 17 years in, had he had paid his dues essentially in the faith. But he he didn't he mentioned it. He didn't rely on that. That's not what he was saying. That's why you should listen to me. You know, um, he still brought that before the brethren what he was preaching. Um, but essentially, we're, we're called to be meek, and the meaning of that, in short, is gentle and patient, and we're called to be bold, uh, which, in short, we, we already heard it means to have assurance, but also means to, uh, to be ready to act. So essentially, we're called to be gentle and to be ready to act. It has nothing to do with our own capability. Um, so let us be gentle and ready to act. Amen. Amen.